Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I would like to uh, welcome all participants, uh, in particular, um, our HRNK co-chair emeritus, Roberta Cohen, who has just signed in. She was a presenter at a, an excellent program a, a couple of days ago. Also, my mother, Dr. Elena Scarlatti, who has just joined in. She told me um, how much she was looking forward to actually meeting both of you virtually um, via Zoom. Um, we uh, look forward to uh, our second second program under our HRNK author speaking series. Last time we featured David Hawk and the Hidden Gulag. Today we're featuring uh, Dr. Marcus Noland, uh, who is also a member of HRNK's board of directors. And we're also featuring uh, Dr. Steph Haggard. Uh, they were the co-authors of our 2005 report, Hunger and Human Rights, of course, they're going to address this in much greater detail, but this is a report that with, well, very small changes is as current today as it was 15 years ago, should be textbook, uh, not only for students of the Korean Peninsula, but for, well, NGO workers active inside North Korea, UN agencies and other relevant actors. Let me go ahead and uh, begin by introducing uh, Dr. Nolan, who is Executive Vice President and Director of Studies at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Neither Dr. Nolan nor Dr. Haggard need a, 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 an introduction who know them so well, such respected and highly regarded scholars in this area. But let me say that uh, Dr. Nolan is unique among American economists in having devoted serious scholarly effort to the problems of North Korea and the prospects for Korean unification. Uh, most recently, Dr. Noland and Dr. Haggard co-authored um, Hot Target, Sanctions, Inducements, and the Case of North Korea. Um, the list of books authored by Dr. Noland, of course, is very long, uh, Avoiding the Apocalypse, uh, Future of the Two Koreas, um, the economics and geopolitics of national resource governance, of course, um, witness the transformation together with Dr. Noland, uh, family in North Korea, markets, aid and reform. Um, Dr. Noland's bio is, of course, available on our website and the, the website of the Peterson Institute. Uh, and that said, what perhaps few of the participants know is that Dr. Noland is also in addition to being such a fantastic scholar and thought leader, a marathon runner. Mark, uh, what was your best result? And are you still running? <laughs> I think it was 332. I think Steph was faster. <laughs> I've never run a marathon, so he, he beats me on that score. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> it was roughly three and a half hours. I think 332. Wow. That, that's, that's incredible. I've never been able to do that and never will be. Um, we know that we have to end the program promptly at 4 p.m. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark, uh, for your introductory remarks. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to participate in this event. Um, as Greg mentioned, I am a member of the uh, HRNK board. I was actually a founding board member of a, uh, HRNK around 20 years ago. And when we started out, we emphasized the production of high quality research. Uh, the first study we put out was one that Greg mentioned, the Hidden Gulag study by David Hawk, which used uh, satellite photography, which uh, at that time was, was uh, relatively uh, unique, uh, much less ubiquitous than it is today, more difficult to do. It took David a long time to produce that report. Uh, we had another study, the centerpiece of which was a refugee survey uh, done in China by uh, Christine uh, Chang. And um, uh, again, uh, the nature of that uh, uh, survey, large scale survey done in China meant that it took a long time to produce the study. The third study we were going to produce was one on the hunger issue. And we commissioned a well-known American academic to produce the study. Um, and basically he jerked us around for more than a year and then in the end withdrew. Uh, 
So we were in the difficult position of, you know, we were essentially a startup. We had gotten some funding. We had really interesting studies, but they all had very long gestation periods. And we were trying to keep the funder kind of copacetic while we were producing these studies. So it fell on me as chair of the research subcommittee to find a replacement author. And I went to Steph Haggard um, and he agreed on one condition, which was that I would co-author the study with him. So I was faced with the, um, with the choice of co-authoring a study with Steph or watching HRNK implode. And so I bit the bullet. So I'm sure we are going to get down in the weeds, but before we do, I wanna make one fundamental point. This when I started working on these issues back in the 1990s, there was a kind of tension between the so-called uh, humanitarian community and the human rights community. Some of that was uh, uh, understandable. The humanitarian community required access in order to do their work. Uh, they had to work with the North Korean government and uh, the North Korean government was an uncooperative partner to say the least. And there was tension within the humanitarian community. There were attempts at um, organizing kind of collective responses to um, roadblocks the North Koreans were putting up. In the end, some of the major private NGOs pulled out uh, believing they could simply, the, you know, their resources would be better served being put elsewhere than North Korea. Um, and the basic point that Steph and I tried to make in this report was that the goals of promoting human rights and food security were not contradictory. In fact, they were self-reinforcing. North Korea had gone through a terrible famine, uh, the worst famine uh, in peacetime famine in the 20th century, uh, at least, uh, well, the, the Great Leap Forward famine in China was larger, but in relative terms, in terms of the size of the population, North Korea's was the worst. It was the only peacetime famine in the 20th century to occur in an industrial or semi-industrial country. Um, and we argued that while uh, things like bad weather and flooding played a role in the famine, fundamentally the famine was the culmination of 50 years of economic mismanagement. That long period of economic mismanagement was only made possible by the fact that North Korea had an utterly ruthless government, uh, one completely unaccountable to its people. The basic human rights, civil rights, political rights, and liberties, things like a free press, the ability to simply move from place to place, the ability to contract, um, the ability to have, through whatever mechanism, impose some kind of accountability on the government. That web of rights and liberties um, constitute a, an enormously powerful bulwark against famine. And the famine could only occur on that scale in a country uh, with uh, such a ruthless and repressive government. So with that, uh, let's get into the weeds. <clears throat> Great. Well, I, 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 my understanding is that uh, I, I would follow Mark. Greg, is that uh, what you had in mind? Steph, may I take a minute to sure. introduce you, although, of course, we will sure. not do an introduction. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Haggard is the Lawrence and Sally Cross Professor of Korea Pacific Studies. Uh, he serves as director of the Korea Pacific Program at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at uh, UC San Diego uh, course, uh, absolutely famous within this uh, world of ours of uh, North Korean and Korean studies and human rights. Uh, Dr. Haggard uh, has done extensive research on North Korea. Um, he has a long-standing interest in transitions to and from democratic rule and uh, the current phenomenon that we are all noticing, the phenomenon of uh, democratic uh, backsliding. Um, of course, in, uh, in addition to, um, to the books that he has authored together with, uh, with Dr. Noland, uh, we all recall uh, his books, including the, the most recent Developmental States, um, published in 2018 on the rapid growth of uh, East Asia. Uh, we all remember Dictators and Democrats, Masses, Elites and Regime Change, published in 2016. And uh, <clears throat> the most recent backsliding uh, democratic regress in the contemporary world. Both Dr. Haggard and Dr. Nolan are, of course, uh, 
all over the international media, uh, published and quoted in, in multiple scholarly publications, true thought leaders. Uh, Steph, thank you very much. And uh, so you're not a marathon runner, but what, <laughs> or you're not a marathon runner any longer, but what are some of your, your current interests and, uh, well, may I say favorite pastimes before we proceed with the actual presentation? Well, I, I think I, it's been forced on me, but my major pastime over the last nine months seems to be Zoom. Um, but the content of that obviously varies from, from session to session. But Greg, thanks very much for the, for the kind introduction. I want to maximize time for questions. So let me just pick up on a few themes that Mark made and also push the research story forward. I've never known whether to um, thank or curse Mark for getting me involved in, the, in work on North Korea, but it, it really did prove to be a quite productive and interesting relationship because Mark brought an understanding of economics, uh, a practical understanding of economics, and I was thinking about the political economy of North Korea. And just to follow on immediately from Mark's comments, I was of course influenced by the work of Dres and Sen on the role, uh, the inoculating role that democracy had with respect to famine and the work that they had done on South Asia, India in particular. And the, the mechanisms here are very interesting because as Mark pointed out, a free press and the election of local representatives constitute information generating um, mechanisms in a society. And one of the things we saw in the famine was because the state wasn't accountable, it was immune from information about what was going on in their own country. And we know from some very interesting interview data about how uh, political officials on the East Coast of the country were, were pleading with Pyongyang to do something, you know, as the famine was breaking and they were unaware of what was going on because they were oblivious, they were politically oblivious. And that had to do with uh, questions of governance and how the country was governed. Uh, this also fed in ultimately to uh, Marx and my contribution to the Commission of Inquiry itself. And there an interesting issue for possible discussion is just the question to which deprivation with respect to food should itself be considered a component of crimes against humanity. And of course the COI did find in that regard or at least found that there was adequate evidence to consider those sorts of, of charges were the regime ever to be held accountable, which we certainly hope someday it will be. I'll just say two other things, and that is that the work on the famine, which ultimately culminated in the book, Famine uh, in North Korea Markets, Aid and Reform, uh, which I really enjoyed writing and, and still I'm quite proud of. I think it's one of the better books I've written. Uh, led us into another cluster of issues that were directly related to food, which is the way in which deprivation generates refugees. And this is not uh, alone a case of North Korea by any means. Everywhere where you see famine, you also see people trying to get out of the black hole of famine by moving. And that generates refugee externalities. And North Korea has had that problem uh, ever since the famine, but certainly during the famine, there may have been as many as 400,000 North Koreans in China. And so we were interested not only in the first order effects of the famine, both positive and normative, the moral consequences, but also the, the, the question of what was happening to the refugees. And then finally, uh, in this last book that Mark and I wrote called Hard Target, we were preoccupied with the question of how sanctions and engagement would be useful, not only for the question of solving the nuclear issue, which tends to dominate American foreign policy interests, but how we should think about the effects of sanctions and engagement on the development of a market economy in North Korea, and thus ultimately on questions of, of personal liberty on the ground. Um, I don't think we had definitive answers in that book to that question, but I, it was really our, our intention to kind of open up that, that dialogue. Well, thank you very much, Steph. Uh, it was terrific. Uh, we actually already have a question from the audience and we're ready to move on to the Q&A. 
I would like to remind the participants that they may ask questions via the Q&A function, via the chat function, or by raising their hand in the participant list. Once again, we will have to end promptly at 4 p.m. And with that, let me begin with a question addressed to both of you, Mark and Steph. Um, in, in the 2005 report in Hunger and Human Rights, uh, and the question comes from Timothy Gu, HRNK, uh, in Hunger and Human Rights, it was clarified that the Kim regime has often denied or redirected international food aid. Uh, Timothy would kindly like to ask what improvements the international community has been trying to make to ensure that starving North Koreans are actually receiving food aid, if any, is to be disbursed to North Korea. Mark, do you want to take this or I'm happy? Let me unmute myself. Sure. The, um, initially, the North Koreans were extraordinarily resistant. Um, would not allow um, outside agencies like the World Food Program to employ ethnic Koreans or Korean speakers. Uh, they wouldn't even allow uh, WFP staff in country to take Korean lessons. Um, and in the report, we, we, we report some anecdotes of eight that I was told by aid workers of at times, um, you know, um, and I won't go into detail how they did this, but, but believing that they were not taken to the right locations that they were supposed to go visit. And in some cases taken to the same location twice and being told it was a different school or, or you know, institution. Uh, so things started out quite, quite bad. Over time, as a, a degree of familiarity developed and um, uh, uh, the level of aid ramped up, the WFP and other groups were able to negotiate better terms. And by the time things kind of peaked around 2006, the WFP was actually doing household surveys and actually really trying to get into the basic demographics of what was going on. Um, and were able to a certain extent to try to monitor distribution better, although monitoring never really was very, very good. Um, my sense, and I would be perfect, I would be very happy to be disabused of this notion, is that, that that kind of period around 2006 represented the peak. And since then, things have gone backwards. And partly it's because the level, level of aid today is so low. Um, you know, aid fatigue has set in after 25 years of, of uh, uh, giving aid to North Korea. And as the amount of aid goes down, the North Koreans become less forthcoming. For them, it's completely transactional. So um, there has been improvements. Um, some of those have been maintained. Some of those have been eroded, but a lot of it simply depends on the volume of aid. And if North Korea were to get into real trouble, and need a high volume aid again, the outside world would be able to uh, negotiate an improvement in terms over uh, what they have now, though I doubt it would be an improvement in terms that any of us would consider adequate. Yeah, I, I think I'll just add a few footnotes to Mark's, to Mark's answer. I mean, first of all, um, it, it may be worthwhile to elaborate a bit on the concept of monitoring because the, the giving of food aid through the World Food Program or through any NGO um, is supposed to be based on basic humanitarian principles. And the basic humanitarian principles uh, are that food should be distributed to those groups that are most vulnerable. And so what you're seeking to do in a monitoring agreement is not just uh, guarantee that food isn't diverted outright, but particularly that it's focused on those that are most in need. And that's what the North Koreans are uninterested in doing for the most part, because they have their own priorities in terms of distribution, particularly to the cities and particularly to Pyongyang, which is this protected enclave, which the elite has invested in very heavily to avoid uh, mass mobilization and other forms of protest from below. Obviously, um, the extent to which this issue arises is a function of food production in North Korea and its ability to tap foreign markets. But we saw last year, for example, this very unusual issue of an appeal uh, by North Korea for food. Uh, and th these have been related nominally to 
uh, weather, weather patterns, flood, floods and drought. But one of the points that Mark and I made both in the original report and in the book is that these so-called natural causes of food shortages ultimately have a deeper political economy because many countries face weather. South Korea faces the same weather that North Korea does, but it's managed the risks of, of uh, domestic food production, shocks to domestic food production by diversifying its economy, by liberalizing, by exporting manufacturers and importing food. And one of the findings of the book was that uh, with just minimal adjustments, the North Koreans probably could avoid, have avoided a significant number of the famine deaths if they'd just been able to access commercial markets with respect to food. So this is a somewhat long-winded way of saying that aid itself is arguably suboptimal because aid is typically designed, food aid is designed to handle short run crises, short run crises. The World Food Program should be seen as a lender of last resort, but that's not the world we are in, in North Korea. It's a perennial crisis where the um, ability or willingness of the government to address shortages is just very low. Steph, following up on that question, uh, may I ask you, we hear this all the time, are the sanctions, UN and US sanctions and other sanctions actually having an impact on the ordinary people of North Korea? If so, how is it possible to assess that impact since fact-finding missions cannot be conducted in country? Actually, North Korea has practically been tightly shut down by the authorities under the pretext of COVID-19 prevention. I was hoping you could comment on that, on the possible impact of sanctions. Well, look, I, I don't want to wax uh, uh, methodological, but, but this is a much harder question to answer than you might think, because you have to ask yourself not only whether the sanctions are having effect, but why are there sanctions in place in the first place. And the sanctions are in place against North Korea because it's chosen to violate a set of international commitments that it had initially under the non-proliferation treaty not to pursue a nuclear program. And so, you know, this is really a tough question because whenever someone focuses narrowly on the immediate effect of sanctions as a causal factor in North Korean distress, it's important to remind ourselves that the sanctions themselves are what social scientists call endogenous to the fact that the North Korea is pursuing a particular uh, political strategic course. So uh, that's just a, a background note, you know, that we have to remind ourselves of. But, um, you know, obviously the sanctions are having adverse effects on the North Korean economy. Um, they're not, I don't think at this juncture, the most serious effect because the border closing in January and February obviously also had, a had, a, had the effect of uh, being a large shock on the economy. But, um, but there, there can be little doubt that uh, I, I made this statement in a webinar a couple of weeks ago and some people jumped on it, that North Korea is a small open economy. And by that, I mean something technical that Mark can also speak to. It's not that it's open in a policy sense, but it's exposed, it's dependent on trade and it's increasingly dependent on China in particular. And as China made the strategic decision, which it subsequently relaxed to impose uh, sanctions on North Korean exports in particular, then the capacity of the North Korean economy to earn foreign exchange in order to import the things which it needs to feed the markets, to feed its productive structure, have obviously been you know, adversely affected. And so you know, there's no doubt that whatever state we were in prior to the onset of the sanctions and the border closure, North Koreans are further worse off as a result of what's happened over the last three years. No question about it. Thank you, Dr. Haggard. Dr. Nolan, Mark, we're going to go to you next with a question from Katie Warnke, um, HRNK. Um, what is your 
assessment of the possible impact of the COVID-19 crisis on the humanitarian situation in North Korea. And let me, Mark, also follow up on that question to ask, you know, we hear that uh, we might be on the verge of a uh, significant humanitarian crisis due to the recent uh, natural disasters, flooding due to COVID-19. Uh, do you think that there is a likelihood to see another great famine, another arduous march, another humanitarian catastrophe happen now, a quarter century after the first one? Are there any factors that might prevent such a crisis from happening? Mark, we'll go to you. So let me stipulate that I don't have any inside information about COVID in North Korea. I think I'm as much in the dark as the rest of, uh, as everyone else is. Um, but I, I think in a very kind of crude sense, COVID has done what sanctions couldn't, which was actually isolate the country. Um, the sanctions were initially undertaken in ways that were supposed to target the elite uh, and target the military programs and leave the common people alone. And I think that's a, ethically a good thing. As frustration ramped up in 2016 with the ICBM uh, tests, um, the sanctions that were put in clearly hit the common people as well because they hit export industries such as textile and apparel and coal. Um, how the economy uh, has continued to operate is a bit of a mystery because if you look at the data that we have access to, and I would question the quality of some of this data, um, one did not see profound macroeconomic changes in the North Korean economy. It's, it is, at least it's not evident. Uh, to the extent that there seem to be any real changes, it actually followed the uh, closure of the border associated with COVID. So first came the sanctions, which clearly had a negative, I mean, as, as Steph said, just logically, they had to have had a negative impact, though it's hard to discern in the data. Uh, and then we had, had the COVID restrictions. Uh, some of the data, such as some of the exchange rate data that we've seen recently, I really question the veracity of that data. It seems to make little sense to me uh, in economic terms. Um, So, and, and, and one of the problems we face with North Korea is that when you look at things like trade statistics, those cannot be taken at face value. China has uh, fabricated or falsified trade statistics in the past. We know that North Korea has um, uh, access to other um, uh, sources of revenue of unknown, um, of unknown magnitude. And now the big one is, is cybercrime. Um, and so it really is difficult to understand how this economy operates and how it finances itself. Now, in the terms of the immediate situation, last night I did a crude back of the envelope calculation. I took the most recent FAO report, which was actually from last year, and things are probably worse now because of the, the weather this summer. Uh, but I looked at the, the, the grain balance and looked at the sort of uncovered our requirements that North Korea had. And using those figures, which are probably underestimates of the situation today, but applying current prices, which are higher than they were a year ago, um, I calculated that basically you could close the food gap for about $400 million. And that's, uh, that's gonna be a, a, that's a, a kind of a, a, a bottom estimate. If you put in money for transportation problems and transportation is going to be more difficult in the case of North Korea because it's relatively isolated and so on and so on. Call it $500 million, half a billion dollars. That's in an economy that's roughly, we guess, is probably something like $25 billion. So a government that wanted to close the food gap could do so by reallocating expenditures. This is completely within the, the scope and capability of the North Korean government to solve. And so it's a little frustrating to see analyses of the North Korean situation that leap immediately to aid, uh, because both in terms of, both in international legal terms and ethical terms and just in practical terms, the first line of defense is the North Korean government. And if they wanted to close this gap, they could. Now, could we get another famine? Because North Korea has been subjected to some negative shocks. And my bottom line answer is no. I mean, you may get some distress, but not another famine. And the reason is twofold. 
Um, the first is that having gone through the arduous march, the North Koreans will not react the same way again. There is a degree of passivity in the North Korean. We talk a lot about what the North Koreans did, entrepreneurial activity, much of it technically illegal to access food and survive. But there are also anecdotal reports from a variety of sources of people basically waiting in apartment buildings in Changjin for food that never arrived. The, the, the population will not, after the last 25 years, will not behave as passively as it did in the 1990s. So the, the, the first line of defense will be the North Korean people because they're just not going to react with the degree of passivity they showed before. The second one is, for all the information problems that Steph and I have talked about, this is a vastly more open place informationally than it was 25 years ago. I remember when I was working on the famine in the 1990s, there were well-known you know, people who were supposedly expert on North Korea, I use the term expert very advisedly in this con context, who were arguing as late as 1997 that there was no famine. There was an exaggeration, it was a hoax uh, to make the North Koreans look bad. Um, you're not going to have that degree of just, you know, it, with, people may argue about the impact of COVID or the impact of sanctions or something, but nowadays we do have access to information through a variety of sources that we simply did not have in 1995. And so for those two, re, and, and so as a consequence, the, the international community will act with a degree of rapidity and forcefulness that it didn't at that time. So for those two reasons, the internal reaction of the people and the likelihood of a rapid and strong international response, you won't get another famine, I don't think. Yeah, if I could just add, add uh, you know, a, a few details again to, to Mark's uh, excellent observations, but it does take us into the realm of the geostrategic. And that is exactly what China is doing vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And I think this really, you know, we have to be clear on this because if you look at the trade data, it looks like trade has fallen off to zero, but that's a little misleading for two reasons. One is that China has a veto power at the UN over the design of the sanctions regime. And one of the things it did was acquiesce to sanctions on North Korean exports but it did not acquiesce to the same level of constraint on Chinese exports to North Korea. And if we look at, at the trade data on food exports from China to North Korea over the recent period, up until the closure of the border, we see these quite significant spikes in late 2019, early 2020 of food going into North Korea. And this is on top of the fact that what looks like an export ban, we know is just an incredibly leaky sieve through a lot of really interesting open source uh, economic work on sanctions evasion coming out of groups like C4 ADS. And we've seen from this that there's just a tremendous amount of leakage of things like coal exports. This isn't small scale smuggling at the border. This is wholesale sanctions evasion, which means that the regime does have access to somewhat more foreign exchange than it would appear if we were just looking at the official Chinese statistics. So again, I'm just bolstering Mark's point that when we talk about the international reaction, this is not just the World Food Program. It's also strategic decisions that China is going to take with how much distress effectively to permit in North Korea. And I think they see a limit. They see it as potentially destabilizing to just let the country go. Thank you very much, uh, Mark and Steph. Um, I think our co-chair emeritus, Roberta Cohen, has a question on access to the prison camp. So let me ask my colleague, Rosa Omar, who's running the comms as the first. Yeah. To turn it over to Roberta. Roberta, please go ahead. Very glad you joined us. Okay. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Loud and clear. Do you hear me? Loud and clear. Yes. Thank you. Oh, you do. Good. Okay. Uh, first, let me thank Steph and Mark for such expert information. Their their analysis and their report um, for HR and K have really stood the years in the sense of being so relevant and framing issues for everyone. Um, 
in those reports. Uh, both of you have mentioned uh, the challenges of distri distributing food to the most vulnerable. Um, we haven't talked about how the most vulnerable is defined, but um, we've talked about distribution to them and that being a humanitarian principle. Um, you also both mentioned the tension between human rights and humanitarian communities and that actually the, they ought to be reinforcing or they should be reinforcing having similar, uh, the same goals. Uh, and yet over this question, there is some difficulty or tension. And I wondered if you would like to comment on it. I would, I would put it this way, that in looking at who the most vulnerable are in North Korea, uh, the Commission of Inquiry report, which came out in 2014, uh, very clearly demonstrated that the most acute cases of hunger and disease in the country and ill treatment were in the camps. There's so much testimony, there's so much narrative and texts on this issue. Uh, and with that came the question of, again, well, I mean, it's not that it had come up for the first time then, but it came up uh, with more perhaps um, um, effort behind it, uh, looking at, well, what about access to these prison camps? What about trying to ask or trying to develop some kind of uh, united group to, to request access to these, to these people on, on humanitarian grounds? Um, and there have been a few interesting developments. Um, it was reported at a USIP meeting publicly that um, one organization that, that um, was, the name was not given and that's fine. Uh, and the North Korean government had uh, developed a, an agreement, an MOU that would possibly, and this would be in the last few years, that would allow uh, humanitarian organizations into the prisons, but it never came to fruition. I think it got dropped with various um, political tensions. Uh, North Korea itself at the UN, there was a universal periodic review you're familiar with where uh, the North Koreans are, when recommendations are made to the state under consideration. And one of the recommendations to North Korea was had to do with access to the camps. And North Korea accepted a recommendation for the first time that spoke of access to the most vulnerable, including to prison camps. Uh, so I wondered, uh, given all the um, natural disasters that, that are coming up and that they are not well prepared for, uh, to what extent do you think the UN should be making an effort to try to reach um, prisoners who are affected by these disasters? And Greg can, can comment on uh, HRNK's role or when Typhoon Lion Rock struck a number of years ago and um, HRNK uh, sent to the UN um, photograph, satellite photos of a re-education camp that had been uh, uh, struck by the, by the uh, typhoon. And HRNK tried to get UN agencies to seek access to that camp, which was among the other affected um, sites. And um, that did not happen but there will be many more. So I wondered if you wanted to look at this or comment on this question in terms of how the two communities can come together on this um, and whether it is some, an issue that needs to be addressed in, in, and in what way. So I would like to just add one thing to Steph's uh, previous answer about uh, the relationship between China and North Korea and the fact that um, uh, the, these, uh, you know, the, uh, they will support North Koreans uh, for a variety of reasons. You may not see this in the trade statistics. The same statement can be made with respect to South Korea. So uh, they will also support North Korea if things really become dire. And the history of South Korea is um, they operate according to what they perceive as their national interests, not according to any particular multilateral commitments. And I think certainly under the current government in Seoul, uh, one would expect a continuation of that behavior. Uh, on Roberta's uh, uh, um, 
uh, question. Uh, as far as I know, no one has ever made it into the prison camps. And until three minutes ago, I did not know that anyone had even asked. Um, I knew that uh, uh, Roberta knows the UN inside baseball way, well better, way better than I do. Uh, I knew that there had been some movement in that direction a few years ago, but my sense was that uh, it was simply too much of a hot potato within the UN bureaucracy, because at the end of the day, people are concerned about um, jeopardizing access over, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 people. Um, but if uh, you are actually able to negotiate access and get access to the camps, that would be a great thing. Um, but to my knowledge, that it's never it's never happened. Uh, Roberta, I, I, let me let me add uh, a few things to what Mark said, um, and maybe be more openly cynical. Um, you know, the North Koreans are never going to allow access to any camp that would demonstrate that those camps are characterized by abuses of torture and violations of human rights. I mean, they're just not going to do that. And if they do allow access to something, it's going to be access to a Potemkin camp. And this is a more general proposition with respect to North Korea, and it's one that plays out in the nuclear space as well, where what do you mean by access? Because if you mean access to sites which the North Koreans can choose and can control for the purpose of disseminating a particular informational message, then sure, they'll grant that type of access. But that's not the type of access we need to really know what's going on in North Korea. And that holds with respect to the nuclear issue. It holds res with respect to the prison camps. It holds with respect to access to information about markets, just down the line. And so I just don't see an authoritarian regime of this sort opening itself up to an international storyline that could anyway be read as a further negative. And so as a result, I, 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 it does not surprise me that these access agreements did not uh, materialize. Now that said, I do think it's the job of the United Nations to put these human rights requests forward and to, for those to be a component of any planning. And how to do that's very delicate, but I don't think we should shy away from saying that the international community sees the problems that North Korea has as not simply ones that are humanitarian, but they're related to underlying rights and the absence of them. Thank you very much, Roberta, Mark, Steph. Um, to answer uh, Roberta's question, uh, in the fall of 2016, of course, in the aftermath of Typhoon Lyrock, we came up with the idea of looking at detention facilities. Under the leadership of our senior satellite imagery consultant, Joseph Bermudez Jr., Joe Bermudez, we have built uh, baseline assessments, uh, updates of detention facilities in North Korea. Uh, the, the cloud cover was very thick, so we could only uh, acquire images of camp number 12 in Chonggori. It's a re-education through labor camp. 80% of the 1,000 women held there are refugees forcibly repatriated by China in direct violation of the 1951 Refugee Convention and the 1967 Additional Protocol. Uh, so the UN was running a rapid assessment in the area. We sent the report and the message basically saying, look, you're in the area. Why don't you look at a most vulnerable group, uh, people in detention, women in particular? You're very quick to respond. Um, then uh, Deputy uh, Secretary General Ian Eliasson wrote to us immediately, right away. Later on, the Secretary General quoted that report um, in his report to the General Assembly. However, on the ground, nothing happened, quite honestly. Uh, access was never requested. Access was never granted. So it, it, it continues to be a struggle. And Roberta is a great proponent of, of the human rights up front approach. Yeah, and not surprisingly. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be continuing to push these themes. Um, and you know, that's part of the, the international community owes it to itself to stand up for its principles. Uh, but I just don't think you're likely to get engagement on this issue. And this is something else I've actually learned from Roberta and I wanna put it on the table, which is 
if you are going to open a human rights dialogue, it's clear that the North Koreans are only going to be interested in that working in from issues which are less controversial, like women or, or uh, people with disabilities, than to start at the core of the regime's fundamental features like the prison camps. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we, we did have a question from none other than David Hawk, uh, HRNK report author, Hidden Gulag, Parallel Gulag. Um, David asked a question about the current food situation, which Mark has already answered in his remark. His other question is about the oil situation. Are the North Koreans getting enough oil for domestic food production? Steph, you want to go or you want me to go? Yeah, I, go ahead. I mean, I've got, we both got our views on this, but... So um, this is one where um, it may sound like I'm punting, but that's, that's not my intent. Um, if you look at fragmentary data on um, the prices of um, oil products in North Korea, they have not been skyrocketing or highly unstable uh, for the most part. Um, which suggests that either they are continuing to, to get oil or uh, refined products through a variety of mechanisms and channels, or that the level of economic activity has gone down so much that, uh, that um, an attenuated supply is consistent with stable prices. Um, my strong suspicion is that they are getting oil and refined products through a variety of mechanisms and that is sort of keeping them afloat. On the specific question, if they got enough oil to operate machinery and to act as a feedstock for the production of fertilizer, I have to tell you on that one, I just haven't been following things closely enough to, to know. Um, uh, th that is a very good question. And um, uh, that would be worth uh, examining to try to understand the food situation moving forward. Yeah, Mark and I and others who watch the DPRK-China relationship are more or less forced to rely on Chinese customs uh, data. And if you look at that data, it seems like it's reasonably complete uh, with respect to the vast majority of products that are traded, traded formally across the border. Obviously, it's not covering things that are smuggled. But Mark and I uncovered one exception to that, which is oil. And, and it's the one place where we've found evidence that the Chinese were just simply not reporting what they were shipping. And again, I think this is related to a broader political game which is going on, which is that China agreed through a succession of multilateral sanctions, which as we know from the Bolton memoir, North Koreans sought to roll back in Hanoi, uh, that, that so, you know, did limit North Korean ex, uh, Chinese exports to some extent to North Korea. But China has the capability to turn the dial outside of those formal restraints in ways that are not visible or are not visible, <laughs> or then perhaps China doesn't think are visible. And so I think what's happened over the last year is a little bit of buyer's regret on China's side with respect to the strength of the sanctions to which they had committed through the UN Security Council process, but correspondingly, a de facto relaxation of those sanctions by permitting large scale smuggling to take place, almost certainly including oil products. And why do I say that? Is because we have smoking, government, smoking gun evidence of it, which is you know, various forms of either satellite or aerial reconnaissance photography that shows ship to ship transfers in the high seas involving Chinese vessels and North Korean vessels, almost certainly related to oil shipments. And if this was within the bounds of the uh, UN Security Council resolutions, which stipulate caps on total sales to North Korea, that trade could be undertaken openly. 
these ships would be docking in North Korean ports and Chinese ports and no one would make a big deal out of it. And the fact that this uh, obfuscation is going on is to me itself evidence of the fact that sanctions uh, caps are being violated with respect to oil. Thank you, Dr. Nolan and Dr. Haggard. As um, Mark, Dr. Nolan mentioned earlier, since Hidden Gulag 2003, authored by uh, David Hawk, who's joining us today, who has joined us today, our methodology at HRNK has combined satellite imagery analysis and North Korean escapee testimony. That said, the number of North Korean refugees resettling in South Korea has declined dramatically over the past year. In 2019, 1,047 former North Koreans resettled in South Korea. As of September 2020, the number in 2020 was only 195, with a higher than before percentage of male escapees, 64 men versus 131 women. This question goes to both of you. What advice would you have for human rights NGOs such as HRNK in terms of adapting our research methodology to the dwindling numbers of North Korean escapees. Steph, shall we go to you first? Sure, sure. Well, look, I, you know, we don't, I don't have a survey information on exactly the kind of constraints and whether they've in fact increased over the last year. But it would seem to me there's a relatively simple explanation for the phenomenon you've just described, which is the, the, the closure of the border um, connected with COVID. So, you know, whether this is a short run phenomenon or a long run phenomena, we'll, we'll see. But I just do want to point out, since we're talking about human rights, that over the course of the last two weeks, we've seen this new spate of, of uh, legislation in North Korea if you can call it legislation, more like diktat, that is addressed at, openly addressed to concerns about ideological impurities of various sorts entering the country. And so um, while I would suggest that the first uh, reason for this diminished refugee outflow has to do with, with, the, with the border closing in COVID, if we go back to the transition from Kim Jong-un Kim Jong to Kim Jong-un, we also saw a diminution of refugees uh, at that break point, December 2011. And so it's not impossible that if the regime is feeling distress uh, and is worried about the domestic political situation, that one of the things you may want to do is control the border more aggressively. And if that's the case, then this could be not just a short run phenomenon, but a longer term development. Thank I mean, you, Mark. The problem is, is that you have possibly a reduced supply because of stabilization of conditions in North Korea. And if conditions in North Korea were to worsen again, you would have greater outward supply. You have the closure of the border uh, for COVID reasons, and prior to that, an increased militarization of the border on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, the Chinese government is much, much harsher now than it was 15 years ago. Um, um, I participated in helping frame this, the survey that uh, Christine Chang did in uh, China, and that survey would be impossible today. Uh, it, it, it's, there was a window where things were relatively open and that window closed pretty quickly. Um, and so some people have been able to make um, studies uh, that are in some ways less satisfying based on travelers to North Korea. And then one of the things that Steph and I did is, as our research interests evolved is we uh, did two formal surveys of uh, one of Chinese enterprises operating in North Korea and one of South Korean firms. Uh, and the focus on those were economic issues, although I ended up writing a paper um, on sort of labor rights uh, coming out of that, um, that uh, uh, those surveys. 
Um, you could use interviews and surveys of people engaged in trade and economic activities, yeah. and moving back and forth um, as well. But none of this is going to um, uh, work very well under the current situation where everything basically is, is, is closed and um, China is uh, much less um, relaxed about things uh, than it was 50, 10 or 15 years ago. Absolutely, yeah, I agree completely. Thank you, Stefan. Mark, one very quick final question. What would be your advice to the incoming Biden administration? How important would it be to finally have again a special envoy for North Korean human rights. We haven't had one since January, 2017. Steph, let me go to you first. Yeah, I'll just make three very quick points on this. The first is that unless North Korea is capable of pushing the North Korean issue up the agenda by doing something like they did to the Obama administration, I don't think North Korea is gonna be at the top of Joe Biden's agenda. Number one, he's got a big domestic plate that he has to uh, feed off of or try to feed. And he's got other fish to fry before North Korea. So, you know, certainly I don't think this is gonna be an issue where day one, something has to be done about North Korea one way or the other. But I think as a matter of principle, the United States uh, and the international community should continue to reveal information that it gathers about North Korean human rights derogations. That's why I have such great fondness for your organization. So um, establishing a, uh, a special envoy on human rights in North Korea is not just a question of, of getting things done. It's a question of signaling to the international community that the United States has returned to a policy of caring about human rights, which we clearly didn't under the, the Trump administration. So I think it's a valuable thing to do. Um, Steph is absolutely right. Uh, when President Biden takes office, he is going to be facing an incredible panoply of domestic and foreign challenges. North Korea is going to be nowhere near the top of the list. Um, and given the nature of policy and the change of regime, the Biden administration is going to have to do a policy review. And, and the great fear is that, as Steph uh, uh, indicated, is that the North Koreans will get impatient and we will have provocations in forms of ICBM tests or nuclear tests um, this coming spring when the Biden, while well, the Biden administration is trying to get uh, itself together. Uh, I think it is uh, absolutely essential that um, a uh, high quality, and I underline high quality person be appointed the human rights envoy. I think Ambassador King did an absolutely wonderful job and we're here very lucky if we could get somebody of his quality back in that job. And I think it is important as it came up in the discussion the other night is that that job be located in the East Asia Bureau. So it is integrated with other aspects of American policy in Northeast Asia and North Korea and is not seen as just some sort of weird thing out there on the human rights track, but is actually integrated with the rest of the policy towards North Korea. Thank you, Mark. Before we conclude, let me remind our distinguished participants that this coming Monday, December the 21st at 4 p.m. Eastern, we'll be featuring our senior satellite imagery consultant, Joseph Bermudez, will be launching our latest imagery report, 150 pages plus on Chungsan Detention Facility Number 11 in North Korea. Uh, Dr. Noland, Dr. Haggard, Thank you so much. This has been such an extraordinary treat. Thank you so much for spending precious time with us. And uh, please do come back to our speaking series. Um, have a wonderful afternoon. I uh, look forward to speaking again soon. Thank you. Well, and thanks to the committee for its excellent work in this space. I mean, you guys are leaders, as you know, but it's, it's an invaluable service that you provide to all of us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sorry everyone. About that. I have to go back to my day job. <laughs> Me too. So Thank you. Bye.